This month we've been studying a biblical understanding of love, and we spent some time already thinking through God's love for us, the need for us to love ourselves, and Jesus' command for us to love others. Now today I want us to put it all together by considering how love should be a way of life for us as followers of Jesus. Now today's scripture comes from the fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. This passage speaks of a lifestyle that's fitting for those who have a new identity in Jesus Christ. And and much of this passage is concerned with the words and actions of those who follow Jesus. And the passage begins with the words, so then, or other translations have therefore. But this ties it to the preceding passage, which speaks of the type of behavior that we should put away. Now, these Ephesians who, keep in mind, are Gentiles, have come to faith in Christ. Paul has been training them in the way of Jesus, and he calls on them to put away their former life of ignorance, hardness of heart, corruption, and so forth, and instead live a life of love and to be imitators of God. So with that said, let's listen now to our scripture passage. It's Ephesians chapter 4, and I will read verses 11 through 25. Actually, I'll begin in verse 25 and go on through chapter 5, verse 2. And this is what Paul writes. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors. For we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the gift of Scripture, and I pray that you will speak now through my words so that we might discern how you are calling us to live and live out the faith in this world. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lorem Ipsum has a major presence in the publishing world. Most everyone who works in publishing deals with Lorem almost every day, but Lorem isn't a hotshot publisher. In fact, Lorem isn't even a person. Lorem Ipsum is the name for the dummy text that's used as a placeholder on a page where it will later be replaced with actual written content. Now, this is particularly useful for those who are page designers. You know, they can lay out a page, insert graphics before any content is actually ready. And by inserting the dummy text, they're able to have a clear idea of what the final product will look like. Now, to help you visualize what I'm talking about, I have three examples to share with you. The first one is of a a poster. This is just a generic poster, but with the words lorem ipsum on it. The second one is of a book cover. And the third one is of a magazine article. Now, each of these are mock-ups with dummy text. But because these words don't mean anything to us, we're able to focus on the mock-up rather than the words. Now, the dummy text is called lorem ipsum because those are the first two words used in this made-up writing. And the name 
lorem ipsum, has been used since the 1500s when an unknown printer scrambled up some words to make a prototype of a book. Other printers started doing the same thing, and now five centuries later, this dummy text is still being used. Now, these words literally communicate nothing. They're meaningless, but they still have a place. Now, we might even say that lorem ipsum illustrates that old saying that our mothers taught us. If you have nothing nice to say, then say nothing at all. And sometimes that's exactly what I wish some people would do on social media or at the end of online articles where readers tend to rant and spout off their opinions. Now, these are two places where we tend to see lots of ugly and hateful language. And if we're not careful, we may be tempted to respond in kind. But to live with love as God calls us to live takes an act of the will. It takes a concerted, intentional, and ongoing effort to practice love in all that we say and all that we do. Now this brings me to our passage from Ephesians where Paul discusses some of the principles that should be a part of a Christian's life. These are principles that really undergird a life of love. These are principles that apply to both our speech and our actions. Now Paul deals first with speech. In verse 29 he says, Let no evil talk come out of your mouths. And then he adds, but only what is useful for building up as there is need so that your words may give grace to those who hear. Now that statement deals directly with speech. But Paul wrote this in the context of a person's attitude and spirit. He writes in verse 31, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Now, as we study this passage, it's important to remember that Ephesians was originally written to a group of Gentile believers. These were people who had left behind their worship of pagan gods and the life associated with it so that they could follow Jesus. And this meant they would have to make some major changes in how they were living. Now, let's also keep in mind that Christianity was not a separate religion at this point in history, but it was a movement within Judaism among some Jews who had accepted that Jesus was the Messiah, as it was promised in the Hebrew Scriptures. And this means that the Jews who followed Jesus had been brought up in following the instructions for holy living that they had learned from Judaism, including the need to avoid unhelpful talk like wrangling and slander and so forth, which rabbis had condemned. They called that kind of talk the tongue of the evil one. But Gentile converts to Christ didn't have that same upbringing. They didn't have that kind of religious instruction in regard to their speech. And so Paul addressed this by citing for them specific examples of the kind of talk that's contrary to a life of love lived in Christ. And in the scripture, he says that we should put away falsehood, let no evil talk come from your your mouths, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander. And then he adds, be kind to one another. And forgive one another. I think these Gentile converts were like the man who came to the Salvation Army and experienced a conversion there. Now, at the time, he had been living on the streets and he came to the Salvation Army drunk one night. All he wanted was a free meal. But after he ate dinner, he stayed for the service. And he came down at the end of the service to accept Christ. And he described what happened to him as his big turnaround. He didn't drink a a drop of alcohol afterwards. 
But he also said that his conversion was, in many ways, just a starting point. Now, he accepted that his sin had been forgiven, but he was still the same self-centered, profane, and uncaring person that he had been. Except now, he was attending worship services each week where he prayed and listened for God. But gradually, he realized that there were things he needed to rethink, do differently, or take on if he was going to continue following Jesus. There were also things that he needed to give up or put away. And so little by little, he began making changes in his life. He became a productive member of his community and a solid Christian, but he never said he had arrived. He rather talked about how he had a sense of where he was headed. Most of the Christians that I have known haven't experienced a big dramatic conversion but all of us have struggled in some way with how we need to shed unchristlike behaviors unchristlike ways in our lives and i think speech is one of those areas where many of us need to to work work on and improve now our speech is one of the i think most significant ways that we can communicate love to others And so as you consider how you might grow in this way, maybe you need to put away some gossip or stop doing those careless put-downs of family members or the nasty comments that you might write on social media. Of course, living a life of love goes beyond our speech. It has a lot to do with what our intentions are, where our hearts are, and to whom we give our allegiance. And it has a lot to do with our actions. Our words and our conduct are the most visible expressions of our love and the faith we profess. And lots of people will view our speech and our actions as evidence that we really follow Jesus or that we don't follow Jesus. If we're serious about reaching out to others, especially people who may not follow Christ, then we need to live in such ways that make love as clear as possible. Now, Ephesians gets us thinking about those parts of our lives that we need to put away. But in Colossians, Paul takes a different approach by talking about what we Christians need to put on. He says in Colossians 3.12, As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Paul's language of putting away and putting on is much deeper than making a wardrobe change. Now, he wasn't suggesting that we just pretend being compassionate or kind or humble or patient or loving. Rather, these traits should become a part of who we are as Christians. And getting there takes prayer. So, for example, the impatient person who sincerely prays, Lord, help me be more patient, may never become the poster child of patience, but he or she will move in the direction of more patience. And likewise, the stingy person who sincerely prays, Lord, make me more generous, is going to find their heart opening more. And a similar thing happens to a foul-mouthed person who says, Lord, help me guard my tongue. The idea that we can put on Christian conduct and speech like clothing, I think gives us something to aim for. And it helps us see how love can become a way of life for us. But to get there, we do need to be grounded in prayer. And prayer is where we can say, Lord, I'm struggling to love my neighbors, and that hurts both them and me. Please help me to find a new way to live with love. There's an old tale about the famous Polish composer and pianist named Paderewski 
that I think makes a wonderful point here. Paderewski lived in the late 1800s and the first half of the 1900s. Several times he toured through America holding one concert after another. And back then, people would really dress up for these occasions. Think about tuxedos and long evening dresses. Well, in the audience one evening at one of these concerts was a, a mother with her nine-year-old son. This mother had hoped that watching Paderewski perform and hearing him play on the piano would inspire her son and encourage him to be diligent with his own uh, practice on the piano. Of course, the boy really didn't want to go, but she forced him anyway, and he got rather antsy in his seat before the show began. He kept squirming around in his seat. When this mother turned to the opposite direction to talk to some of her friends, her son slipped away, and he ran toward the grand Steinway piano that was on the stage. Now, no one in the audience noticed this until the little boy put his hands on the keyboard and started playing chopsticks. Well, this crowd suddenly became quiet. Lots of people were irritated and weren't happy. One guy even shouted out, get that boy away from there. Well, backstage, Paderewski had overheard all those sounds and the commotion, and he quickly ran out on the stage. He came, came up right behind the boy, and he reached around him, and he began to improvise a melody to harmonize with chopsticks. And as the two of them played together, Paderewski whispered in the boy's ear, Keep going. Don't quit. Keep on playing. That's an important message for us to hear when it comes to living a life of love. It isn't always easy to do this. Frankly, some people are really hard to love. And on our end, we may say things to others that we wish we could take back. We may do things that don't reflect the life that Jesus calls us to live. We may make mistakes. And there are times when it seems like we're doing no better than a nine-year-old playing chopsticks on a piano. And yet, when we think we will never measure up and live like we should, Jesus leans over to us and whispers, keep going. Don't quit. Keep on living a life of love. The presence of Jesus in our lives changes us, and it enables us to do things that we can't do on our own. Jesus helps us love others through our words and through our actions, and ultimately, he helps us live a life of love. That's the direction the Lord is leading. And I hope all of us will follow.